go. All right. So um, those of you ha who have been uh, amongst us uh, for some time already know this, but some of you may be new to us. Uh, by us, I mean Katiso Teachers of Pronunciation Interest Group. Um, we have a message board through katiso.org, and that is Katiso Top, which is our moniker, right? And we also have a Facebook top group. So if you are a member of Facebook and you have a Facebook ID and you would like to join us on Facebook, just search for Katisal Topic or Teachers of Pronunciation and you will be able to uh, join us there as well. Um, we do have a top padlet, which is at that tiny URL. I think Patrick will probably uh, drop that into the chat, right? And on our Padlet, we have um, some information that might be of use to you teachers. And first of all, it talks about the purpose of TOP. I'm one of the co-founders and I continue to be a co-coordinator. You can see who our coordinators have been through the years. What's really of value to many people is that you can get access to our recorded PD professional development webinars. Uh, we have some conference presentations as well. Those are face-to-face -face in many cases, except during the pandemic when we did things virtually. And many of those offer you screenshots or slideshows or videos, uh, if not a recorded presentation, right? Take a look at the Padlet some days. Join the top IG e-list. This is something that is outside of Katisal. You do not need to be a member of Katisal. Patrick helps send out information about our PD events that are coming up to all people who um, enroll in it. More important is that we're going to hear and find out more about the color vowel and from our expert. Now, you know, Karen and I know each other from um, hanging around in pronunciation nerdy kind of circles right yeah <laughs> pretty nerdy circles <laughs> fun ones yeah and uh so um it's been uh you know you may already know karen from having been in california and presented uh as our uh, plenary speaker in northern california a regional conference we did that a couple of years ago was that 2019 18 one of those times in uh, like 15 almost, I don't know. Long ago. Anyway, we've known each other for a long time and I'm really glad to get her here because she can give us a hands-on with um, how to use it, what it does for us, how it will help our students. So let me just hand it over to Karen. Um, and we're gonna get started. I wanna tell you sort of my, my thought today is to focus on practice. Mm -hmm. I've been training a lot of teachers lately and. We're focusing on teacher talk versus student talk. And I've been really struggling with this sort of mythical number out there of we should be aiming for 80% student talk and 20%, sorry, yeah, 80% student and 20% us. And I just love to know who's hitting that mark? Because <laughs> I, I think it's hard to hit that mark, isn't it? Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of hitting that mark, you know, the reasons we don't is that we, we can always tell ourselves we talk too much. And at the same time, you think, well, what, how can I talk less about this? Because there's a lot to say about pronunciation. And so I find that if you switch the, the focus to practice, and if you engage in practice and talk less, uh, then we can start to up that percentage more, uh, more effectively toward that 80% ideal um, and, and if anybody has a different set of ideals, like something more realistic, let me know how you aim for it. But I'm going to go for that really amazing 80-20 kind of uh, ratio there. Okay. Um, for this, we're going to do it all hands on. So if you are comfortable and ready to turn on your camera, I'm going to want to see you because I'm modeling a couple things. Uh, not just these activities that you can go take, but I want you to feel what it's like to do this kind of practice. And I want you to also see how I do this online. So it's I've got a lot of things nested in here, like kind of like some kind of weird onion, um, you know, or it's a it's an enigma wrapped in a metaphor, wrapped in an oxymoron, or something like that, right? Um, we want you to get all of those 
those touch points through this activity. So thank you so much for, for cameras. If you don't turn on your camera, it's okay. Um, you can still participate. And I'd love to hear from those of you who are in that situation. You know, you might be in a place where you can't or simply it's not practical to turn on your camera. Um, we're all going to be speaking throughout today's session, but you'll have your mutes on mostly. Um, so there's going to be a kind of a, a locking in. And I want you to kind of listen for or wait for this, uh, what I'm going to call a buzz, uh, a sense like, ooh, I'm right in the pocket. I'm right in the zone of what it is we're doing. And I want you to feel that buzz. And I'll kind of, you know, say, was that a buzz for you? I'm going to see if you get that feeling of syncing up, especially if you can kind of put yourself in the mind of your learners and how they approach spoken English right now versus how you would like them to feel when they're speaking English. Ooh, that was a lot. <laughs> Before we start, I would like to, uh, first of all, just let you know, Jennifer Campion here in the room, um, she's my, my business partner and manager, and she's here to answer questions while I'm talking. Uh, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat because she's, she's a pro and she's there to answer. So there she is. Um, that said, if you have questions that you know you hope I'm going to address today, put them in there now, you know, and, and that way I can weave it in as well as having explicit answers. So, all right. Well, let's get started with the chart. I saw the numbers and it looks like we've got some familiarity with the chart in general. I have it behind me. I'll refer to it a lot because it's not just an object to look at. It's really a point of reference with the, the body and the mouth, which is what we're getting to right now. Um, I'm going to start, though, with uh, sharing some slides, and I'll be showing you several different kinds of practice, uh, trying to up student speech, even while we're still speaking, okay, and we'll try to minimize explanation, okay? I'd like you to find your dominant hand, <laughs> something like this, probably your right hand, um, and you'll, in this one, you're going to repeat after me. Um, and simply listen to what I say and then repeat it with me. So I'll say each thing twice. In this case, we'll start in the upper left corner at green T E. Try that. Question. I have a question. Yes. Would you like mics on or off? During uh, mics off. Everybody's oh, muted. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, because otherwise this will be like a, a cacophony, right? That's Great. Perfect. Clarity. Thank you so much. And then the other thing I should clarify, I'm using my hand and I'd like you to try using your hand. Uh, because we're really going to mentally spotlight the moment of the vowel right here. No more explanation. Here we go. Green T E U. Green T E. Silver pin I U. Silver pin I. Gray day A. Gray day A. Red pepper E. Red pepper a eh. black cat a ah. black cat a ah. olive sock ah olive sock ah auburn dog ah auburn dog ah turquoise toy oi turquoise toy oi Orange door or orange door or rose boat o rose boat o wooden hook u wooden hook u blue moon u blue moon u a cup of mustard a uh, a cup of mustard, a uh. purple shirt, er, purple shirt, er, brown cow, ow, brown cow, ow, and white tie, eye, white tie, eye. Good. These are the vowel sounds of English. I'm going to ask you if you have any top of mind questions based on what we've just done. I have a question um, whether there exists a West Coast English version of the chart. Oh, Patrick. So 
<laughs> I'm from California, um, and I want you to know that I started out with a version that we called the Western U.S. English version. Um, so yes, we did. Uh, there's a reason that now we have, it's been a long journey. It's been about 22, 23 years since I created the chart. So I used to have a West Coast version or Western U.S. used to have what we called we, uh, we really messed around with like, what do you call it, right? The ones who have what? The ones who have Auburn. The, the cot cot merger. Exactly. So what we've done instead, it, over time, we found it really impractical, first of all, because we had to talk with every teacher to figure out and help them understand what their dialect of English was. You can imagine how impractical that is. It's also iffy because some people actually have multi-dialectal backgrounds, right? So they are this and they're that. Um, we do have a Commonwealth version, which we can talk about another time, because that really is a slightly different vowel system. And yet it really maps on beautifully. So we have a unified chart for all of North America. And what I'll tell you right now is as a Californian, I, I was born in Bakersfield of all places. And um, this line right here helps all of us from the West or from parts of the world that have a merger here because it signifies over time and learners will ask like, what's that gray line? Or I can't hear the difference between these. And you can say, you know what? This is actually one category and we're gonna call it olive, okay? So I did this warm up knowing that somebody would ask and because you're a teacher, I just gave you the kind of technical explanation. But with a learner, you can say, these are very similar and we're going to use olive for all of our words, okay? So you'll see, me playing with both, but that line that's gray uh, acknowledges exactly what you're noticing. Okay, thanks. Another question. And by the way, not everybody, I would guess, uh, depends on where you're from. Maybe some of you thought, what did Patrick really ask? So Patrick was noticing what? Patrick, can you just say in your own words that? Sure. So in California English and most of the West Coast, um, speakers tend to pronounce auburn and dog and olive and sock with the same merged vowel sound yeah and we'll call that olive for the sake of simplicity okay so if auburn and dog and sock and olive all sound the same to you see what i did there all <laughs> then you are a merger and you're going to just use olive and you won't basically use auburn very much Okay. However, it's also useful, everybody from the West, uh, you have students who have studied with British English teachers, all kinds of Commonwealth English teachers, people from the East Coast, people who have Auburn. And so it's really useful just to know that it's there and that it's only slightly different. Okay. And, and that's about as much as we'll say about that right now. Great. Let's move along. But notice that this was just a moment of absolute practice. Did anybody notice that I was keeping a kind of a beat? Did anybody hear the snap? Yeah, you heard that and felt that. So you kind of got into a mode, I would say, where you knew it was going to click along. It wasn't a question of when do I join back in, but rather that beat keeps it going. And we move into kind of a musical lyricism and, and we get through this kind of exercise, getting to know the vowel sounds or reviewing the vowel sounds of English. So that's a kind of practice. Second kind of practice I wanna to raise today is color it out. This is a game built on the images that you saw pop up along the way. So now we can use those images, free ourselves of the need of IPA symbols or any kind of phonetic symbols. And we can do a kind of pure practice, kind of 100% practice where the learners are doing all of the talking. And I'll go ahead and I'm gonna stop share there and show you what this game looks like briefly and we're gonna play it together. My setup today, because I'm here on Zoom, um, I could play this game in probably eight different ways, but today we're going to play it as my tabletop version. And we'll simply start by knowing I've got cards right here, and you can see that we have a number of cards. We're simply going to pick a discard pile. I'm gonna go ahead and pick um, important and very. So we have orange door important and red pepper very. If I'm working with lower literacy or beginners, I might. You know, every time I talk, I might turn these around and say red pepper vary. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I have a card here, um, let me start with, I don't know, I see Abigail. Abigail, do you see a match of either red pepper or orange door over here? And if so, can you go ahead and name it? Either red pepper or orange door. Yes. I 
don't. Let's see. Red pepper, orange door. Oh, sorry. There it is. Yes. Orange door. Quarter. <laughs> right. Quarter. So we can take this word. I'll go ahead and flip it since we're making a match this way. And here's the spoken turn, the 100% that you're training your learners to do. Orange door important. Orange door quarter. Okay. And we're going to use our hands the same way we did in the warm up because we're helping our minds notice not just that there is a vowel sound, but that it's the stressed vowel sound. So let's play that one more time. Everyone can follow um, Abigail as she walks through this. So here's the order again. I'm gonna have you show it like that, okay? Start with orange door. Can you walk us through that? Sure, it'll be orange door, important, orange door, quarter. Okay, yeah. So just go ahead and lead that. Yep. Orange door, important orange door quarter right so we're using the rim we're using the image and we're using the word and we have six of these beats so that by the time you get to the sixth beat on this second word so we have one two three one two three by the time you get here whatever your eyes are seeing you're overriding slightly with what you've already heard five times so everyone try that with your hand orange door important orange door quarter what would a student be likely to say if they didn't have all that scaffolding leading up just by itself without any markup with no color quarter quarter at best right quarter great so we're we're priming them to succeed from the very beginning in this game um, orange door quarter great so i'm going to now put a new card down this is my discard pile. We've got black cat have and orange door quarter. Jennifer, would you like to pick the next play? Sure. What about, um, do I just pick a, the girl? You could pick girl? either an orange word oh. or a black word. Oh, gotcha. From over there. Okay. So um, to go along with have about last. Great. Okay. So I'll take that and we'll go with last. Great. There's your play. You want to model that for us with a hand? Starting yeah. With have black cat have black cat last fantastic and everyone could copy that in the room ready black cat have black cat last uh, this one does not have a lot of challenge in terms of the letter versus the sound but it is a tricky sound so i could take a moment to anchor my students if i hear them saying black cat have black cat last that would be a pretty you know predictable kind of outcome if we have Spanish speakers, for example, in the room or anybody with that a, a, e, o, u kind of vowel system. So if I hear last and I want to get a little bit more to last, I could turn over to the chart for a minute and just come over here and notice that the chart is a map of the space inside the mouth starting up here at E. So try this, if you would point either right here, if I spotlight myself, I can go to a spotlight like that. You can put your finger right up here where my hand is. We're going to slide right down that line. And that's going to correlate with dropping our jaw while we're smiling. So go ahead and smile. E, E, E. And now keep that same lip tension, but just drop your jaw as we go along. And you'll hear E. Uh huh. You could also put your arm out this way, not touch anything, and just kind of come down with a really straight arm. Feel that tension in the front. Yeah. Ah. And at that moment, I can return to play and say black cat last because I've anchored the sound in the jaw position with the smile engagement. So that kind of back and forth when you're getting someone up and started with the game can be really useful. Okay. Let's come back to our game briefly and then I'll take questions about this. So we've just played Black Cat. I'm going to do another discard. And let's do one more play. Um, I see, let's see, another volunteer. Patrick, why don't you pick another play? And again, this is our discard pile. Oh, sure. Um, what color should I pick? Either purple shirt or black cat. OK. Um, I've always had, had, had a tough time with the R sound. So I'll do uh, first. Oh, uh, sorry. It's um, purple shirt first. Mm -hmm. Purple shirt girl. Beautiful play. Great. And so when you say you've had trouble with the R sound, uh, you want to tell us more about that? Oh, well, 
Polish is my first language. I learned English as a second language as an adult. Uh, I mean, not entirely as an adult, but like uh, the American um, way of pronouncing things. So I've always, in, in Polish, we have a um, an R that's similar to the flapped uh, American T, like we say R, like, like in water. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the retroflex R, like in American English. Is, is is a little bit challenging because um our muscles aren't trained to to go there right so that's right. the the purple shirt uh, yeah is is, a, is is a hard one to to um to to learn for for a polish speaker okay wonderful well and there's a second little piece of this particular turn this purple shirt first purple shirt girl which is that i can be kind of distracting visually to some learners right they might say what when they see that i fear so i saw abigail's face exactly notice yeah. how i watch your face i mean i can just see what you're doing i don't have to have you unmute and all that fierce is what will often come out fierce so we want to have that override say this is a purple word and we can find it same way we're able to find yeah black we can do other forms of this vowel yoga is what's kind of what we refer to it as to find and anchor the position and i think talking to you know hearing from patrick um what i hear is that in polish the r really triggers a consonant behavior a touching is that right? Uh, 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 something like, or, uh, uh, or something. Uh, yeah, it, it's a tapping, like uh, 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 kind of like the Spanish one. Right. So it's very much a consonant behavior where it's touching. And this is the yeah. roof of the mouth, by the way. The top of the chart, just beyond the color, is the roof of the mouth. So we can come up. If we take black, let's do that again. Yeah. You may be thinking, like, Karen, you're so far from purple. What's the deal? But what's neat about yeah is it gets us anchored way down low. So try that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now we can relax our smell. Ah, ah, ah. And now we can come up because now we're in this central piece where we're not smiling. The tongue is relaxed. Ah, doctor sound, right? Ah. Now, if you simply raise your jaw, don't think about your tongue. Don't think about your lips. Just raise your jaw slowly. Ah. And you might be in this kind of strange place where you think, huh? And now say car. R, 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 r. And notice the difference between r, r, and r, r, r. Okay. So the let's say the the Polish r, 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 is if you come straight in for a purple sound, you're going to trigger a consonant behavior. But if you come from the vowel side coming up and just kind of find it, it's this less touchy kind of thing. It's a vowel more than a consonant in English, er, er. And now we can start matching it, you know, purple, shirt, er, bird, and girl, okay? So that's kind of just a little touch on how the chart helps anchor us in that space, tiny little space, you know, really hard to tell someone like, move your tongue a micro inch and you might be in the right spot. But we can really start to experiment with what we're doing in our mouths without talking too much about it. And that's what the chart affords us when it's nice and big and close by. Okay. Any questions? So we played a little bit of color it out and I'll give you a moment to ask questions just about that. Um, the game uh, that we played is, you know, laid out. It has wild cards. It has uh, over 200 words in it, instructions and so forth. Um, but all of those icons help us really just cut straight to the chase. Green tea people, green tea here is one play, right? And then each card starts to support a couple of other activities. You've got Uno-like play. You can play it like dominoes and lay it out on the table and see everything. You can play go fish. Um, I love the make a sentence option. Like if I was going to play green tea people, green tea here, I could then say, go ahead and make a sentence with that. You know, and then they say, oh, green, okay, did you hear that the people arrived? You know, something that they might improvise on the moment. Um, or you can make a sentence out of one card, or you can tell a story that, that evolves over time if you play sort of as a laid out version. So lots of options here, all of them speaking practice with opportunities for correction, feedback with little adjustments, okay? Comments and questions. Okay, 
I'm going to move into um, what's called a word-based warm-up. We're coming back to the chart for a minute. And to do this, I'm actually going to just show you my chart. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to cover um, or identify a topic, but I won't tell you what it is. We're going to use the chart in the same order, same kind of thing with your hand, but you're going to pick up each word that I say and piece together the puzzle to figure out what's the topic of this unit that I'm about to teach you. So sort of sort of hypothetical, right? Because we're not, you know, I'm not your real teacher, but uh, let's go ahead and give that a try. You can mute yourselves and try this. Pay attention to how engaged you are and have to be in order to do this activity. And, and then we'll chat a little bit about the activity itself. Ready? Here we go. Uh, by the way, I'm going to start with a word um, and you'll see how you can join me almost immediately after the first turn. So I'll give you one example. Meal, meal, green tea, meal. Notice that you can join in the moment I point here. Ready? Meal, meal, green tea, meal. Try the next one. Itinerary, itinerary silver pin itinerary transportation transportation gray day transportation adventure adventure red pepper adventure travelers travelers black cat travelers lodging lodging olive sock lodging walking walking auburn dog walking or if it's you uh, for patrick for example you might just stick with olive or you can skip it but stick with me for a minute okay here we go enjoyment enjoyment turquoise toy enjoyment coordinator coordinator orange door coordinator host family host family Rose boat host family, cooking classes, cooking classes, wooden hook cooking classes, tour guide, tour guide, blue moon tour guide, shuttle bus, shuttle bus, cup of mustard shuttle bus, insurance, insurance. Purple shirt insurance, mountains, mountains, brown cow mountains, hiking, hiking, white tie hiking. And stop. What kinds of practice did you just get? There should be several layers that come to mind if we tease this out. You can stress, open up. like the individual word stress. There we go. So we had long words like transportation. Any other words you remember? Itinerary. Itinerary. That's a tricky one, right? Especially if somebody's like itinerary, you know, then it's just like, what did you say? I don't know. Uh, so itinerary. Great. Well, stress. What else? Insurance. Oh. Yeah. Insurance was another word. Exactly. So I could do a whole recall, by the way. That's a wonderful review. What words do you remember? Do you remember what the green word was? I could have whole mics open, have everybody kind of fill in. Do you remember? Do you remember? Right? So a little recall there. <laughs> Marsha, you're lighting up. I see you. <laughs> what do you, do you want to say anything or are you just excited? I think the word was meal. Yeah, meal, exactly. And so we could go through, right? And just like, do you remember the mustard word? And what's neat about this is, you know, all of us in the room are teachers, but you'll find that learners might remember a word, but it wasn't the mustard word, right? They might remember the word, for example, um, I don't know, lodging and say, you know, is, lodging was the mustard word. You're like, oh, let's listen to that. Lodging, la, ah, ah, olive, sock, lodging. So now we're getting into, you know, their perception of vowel sounds or their production of vowel sounds. So that's a really neat way to, to engage. So they got stress practice, what else did they get as we walked through the chart? What kind of practice was that? Just I'm, I'm, I'm thinking listening comprehension too. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, they may not have known all the words. They might have known 70% of the words. Did you figure out what the theme is, by the way? 
what's the unit I'm about to introduce? Jennifer, what is it? Uh, it sounded like travel. Yeah, travel. You know, it could be tourism, could be travel, planning a trip. Any of those would have worked, right? So you were piecing together the puzzle. I've got you engaged on a bunch of different levels. Like, oh, what's the puzzle? Uh, what was that word? Um, oh, what? Oh, that's a black word. I didn't know that was a black word. You know, so there's a lot happening all at once. And I love that kind of lighting up the brain in a bunch of different ways, as well as musically, again, because I followed a rhythm and I kept you in that zone. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Any comments or questions so far? And I'm going to yeah. the vowels um, on the position as you got it positioned in the front of yeah. the mouth, or the back of the mouth, that sort of a thing. So getting them used to um, where the sounds are in relation to each other and how adjacent sounds like ah and all are really close to each other, right? And how they're right. ah, close to each other in this way. Yeah. And so, you know, if you have Brazilian Portuguese speakers, they're going to have certain challenges right here. If you have Spanish speakers, they're going to have a challenge right here. So every, you know, every language speaker will have their own little place, but everybody cares about these low front and mid vowels. So that's another story. Uh, you'll find a lot of commonalities there. Okay. Um, a couple of things I would do with this activity next, and I'll just sort of show you uh, my cheat sheet of that activity uh, when I'm doing that. So I could I could show them, but that'd be kind of premature, right? I don't want to just jump to like, here's the words. Rather, I can start by saying, um, here's the oral oral that we just did. Let me make this a little bigger for myself. I could then say, well, let's do dictation. You know, what words do you remember? Let's dictate them and let's fill them in on our own charts. So the students will have their own, uh, either a, a color valve organizer or a black and white version of this chart, all kinds of ways to do it. But there's lots of room for dictation, which is that perfect bridge between listening and writing, right? So now we're starting to bridge that gap between what it sounds like and what it looks like. Um, we can then check against the written form and do some spelling aloud checking. Uh, so there's all kinds of practice in spelling aloud. I, I love to mention how all students need tons of practice spelling aloud. It's the solution to communication you know, problems that we sometimes have. And we do it all the times ourselves, right? You spell words aloud. So don't forget to get that spell aloud practice in there. Um, and then reviewing, you know, they could be going right back through it. We could actually do it a second time at the end of this, say, 15 minute debrief, where we once again go through these while looking at them. And now you have eyes and ears on the same, you know, sensation at the same time, like, like uh, you know, transportation, it looked like transportation. And now I'm going to make it a gray word, okay? So there are a couple ways to just really um, take advantage of each slide. But I'm going to move along. Um, this was an oral, uh, you know, the beginning of oral to written. You start getting into writing. Uh, with the color valve organizer, uh, you, can, you can ignore this on the left right now. But this is a whole organizer where, let's say the whole unit was hospitality and tourism. Some of you teaching community colleges, is that right? Right, you might have some. Okay, so in community college, you know, you're going to have students who are already studying certificates in certain areas, maybe tourism, um, hospitality. I just kind of chose this as a guess or as a a way to to fantasize, frankly, because I thought about a news based topic, but that all depressed me. So today's topic is hospitality and tourism because I want to pretend I'm traveling next. Um, and so this is an example of of how words accumulate when learners are using the color vowel chart and noticing where the stress is, what color it is, and then recording it. Um, this is a, what I would call a cheat sheet for the teacher to prepare their unit in advance. But the learners, you can imagine, are writing these words. They're underlining the stressed vowel sound so they know where the stress is and they know what color it is. And, and this is just a general daily practice that the words accumulate over time in a given unit or a given week. Um, whatever the topic of conversation is, and they're able to go home and practice these words. The practice that we're talking about in, in this case is flooding. Um, flooding here is an acoustic flooding that we're talking about, and I'm going to start by having you choose um, a category. I'm going to borrow Patrick's category and just say, let's work with purple shirt words today, okay? Um, these are the purple shirt words that have accumulated here, and the way we'll flood is we're going to read through these three times, you're going to use your hand, 
and we're going to start out slow. I'm going to take it up a notch and we're going to go a little faster. Okay. And so here's how it sounds. You can follow along. We'll do the purple shirt er each time. So three times through purple shirt er down. Second time purple shirt er through and third time. Okay. Um, here we are flooding purple shirt. Ready? And again, notice the buzz. You want to be right there with me in sync, not repeat. Ready? Purple shirt er courtesy emergencies insurance merchandise service workers purple shirt er faster courtesy emergencies insurance merchandise service workers purple shirt er go purple emergencies insurance merchandise service workers and stop I could have done it a fourth. I felt like I could have done it a fourth, okay? Um, but they're getting lots and lots of practice overriding what they see with what they know they need to hear out of their mouth. They now know these are purple shirt words. They've, they've written them down. They've accumulated these. Um, and so now they need to kind of unwire and rewire from emergencies and in, uh, say um, merchandise or workers to workers and merchandise and courtesy, not whatever it might've been. Cow, co I'm not sure how many different ways that could come out. Yeah, cowardice, coercy, who knows, right? So we're, we're, we're teaching the unbelievable here. The unbelievable to the student is no way, this is not purple. I cannot believe that. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it's purple. And, and they say, I don't believe you. And you're like, well, we can look it up in the Blue Canoe Dictionary, which is kind of where we're heading next. Okay, but any questions about flooding before we go in that direction? So you want to be speeding it up. You want to do lots of repetition. And this is choral repetition. Um, this is a room where I've not gotten to hear your voice. If we have time, you know, if we had time as a classroom in a real setting, I would open up the mics and I'd say, Abigail, can you go ahead and flood the purple shirt words? And then I'd have Bali do it and Dora, you know, so we'd go around the room and I'd hear you and I'd be able to adjust your purple shirt once again as needed. Okay. So it's not just uh, me having faith that you're doing it. You're now going to be, you know, in the hot seat and you get to see if, if you're on target. Okay, great. All right, let's move along. Um, I did mention Blue Canoe in the title, so we're going to move into Blue Canoe. Uh, Blue Canoe is a mobile app that was built around the color vowel method. And so it's it's been an incredible journey. It's been since 2016 that um, I've worked with engineers to build the app so that not only are all of the cues color vowel cues and all of the markups helping prioritize stress and rhythm and then vowel quality, um, but also that it, it creates a lot of practice and provides feedback in those color vowel terms through machine learning and uh, voice recognition. So it's some pretty exciting stuff. Um, the, this is for adults. I want to be really clear. Uh, the interface is really best for adults. I would say the game that you're looking at, which is color it out, the same game we were playing earlier, um, that can go down to pretty, pretty young. I've had young learners grab Blue Canoe and just enjoy playing color it out a lot. So you can get down into the the seven, sixes, and fives uh, of the five-year-olds with their parents' app, let's say. But the app itself mostly has adult professional workplace content. So just if you're kind of excited about it, know that. Um, the word-based games are a lot of fun. They do provide that feedback. Um, I'm not going to spend more time on Colored Out because we've already played, but imagine, you know, if somebody says, um, let's see, Blue Moon username, blue moon requitement uh requitement and so the machine learning will hear requitement and come back and say this is a blue moon word not a green tea word so it'll actually say i heard you use green tea it's not it's blue moon and then you try again in your turn and and then it passes you okay uh, we've built it so that it's not always going to correct because it'll break the flow of the game if every time they make some kind of error it stops them so we kind of find this, this piece between um, correction, correcting everything and not correcting anything to create flow. Um, and we think we've, we've kind of hit the mark on that one, okay? But moving along, I'd like to move into the sentence-based lessons of Blue Canoe. I'm gonna show you what these look like in just a moment here. Um, there are lots and lots of topics, dozens of topics. 
And if we kind of move along into say travel, you'll see that there are lessons and each lesson has six sentences in it. So it's very, at some point you drill down and you get very specific about what it is you're practicing, okay? Um, we're going to practice this one for a moment. Um, here's the sentence and I'm actually gonna switch out to my phone so you can see it in real time. Let me grab it for you. If you have questions, go ahead and post those, but let's go grab this as I can just play the audio while you look at this screen capture. It's beautiful. So let's do that. So in on the phone, when the student has it, they can listen to this. And it's not just you can listen to it, it's that you actually are trained to listen to it because it's not just a matter of listen and repeat. Um, let me grab that travel. And here is my airport travel sentence. There we go. So let's listen to this and I'm gonna flood it. Remember what we did with flooding? We just listened to it over and over till it kind of gets rhythmic. And that's what I want the student to experience here. So here's that sentence. It takes a while to get through security. It takes a while to get through security. Watch me and do me. It takes a while to get through security. It takes, hmm. it, it takes, takes a while to get through, through security. security. It, it takes a while to get through security. security. It takes a while to get through security. You see what we're doing? We're we're syncing up with the recording and really starting to hear the music of it. Ba 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 ba. Listen again. It takes a while to get through security. So if you have your student, if, and we train you to do this in my company over at English Language Training Solutions, how to use the hand and the body to really start to uh, to feel the rhythm of English so that when they become used to that, they start using the gestures that English speakers use too. So these are all corollaries to the everyday gestures we either do with our hands, with our head, with our eyebrows, but we formalize it with a hand so that they can light up their awareness of how rhythm plays a big role in English. One more time. It takes a while to get through security. It, it takes, takes a while, while to get, get through security. security. Great. And from there, once you've done it several times, we can also listen to each of the key words. Notice that only three are, are marked up. And because that's because those are the three content words of each of these phrases that you see. So we've had mindful line breaks. Um, if we hear, it takes a while to get through security. Just do while, get, and security. Ready? It takes a while to get, get through security. security. One more time. It takes a while, while to get, get through security. So if we can even just hit those three main words, the other tiny syllables will start to wrap around and be reduced without having to talk about it all the time. That's the irony of talking about unstressed syllables is that we focus on them and then they become even more likely to get stressed in a strange way. Have you found that to be the case? Like, let's talk about stress. Let's mark it. And then it's like, no, don't do anything. Get it really small. So we try to um, to actually do unstressed by raising the focus of the stress syllables and letting the other things wrap around. I can take that sentence, though. If we're having trouble with reduced syllables, watch what we can do together. I'm going to use both of my hands this time. Try this. It takes a while to get through security. 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 It takes a while to get through security and stop. Great. So we start to get that sense of the big, long time on vowel versus the smaller things that wrap without focusing on the things that wrapped into the tiny unstressed syllables. Okay. So there's a lot that can be done with Blue Canoe, um, both you know with you, the teacher next to it, and then when the student goes off by themselves with the app, they know they have these kinesthetic musical strategies to get closer and closer to the model. So they're training themselves. They're not just hoping they're right. They're training themselves to get closer to that rhythm, okay? And then to apply it more generally to their speech. Questions or comments there? And this, by the way, this will be the, the last piece. So we now have time for questions and comments. This concludes the different activities that I've presented today. And again, the theme has been practice, uh, that idea of getting our students to do more practice that is going to be on target, not just guessing or hoping practice, but practice like, I know that I'm saying this word in the zone or this phrase by anchoring, 
by matching the music of it, by getting into the rhythm and producing it that way. So um, I hope this has been helpful to you. I'll take questions now. Don't be shy, folks. You know, with now time, <laughs> open the microphone to turn them on and say stuff. Right. That's right. I'll just say <laughs> I enjoyed this, and um, I'm very happy to see how we can uh, employ the color vowel and blue canoe in our um, in our teaching. Um, those of you who know me like know that I also do a lot with physicality and introducing those sorts of things, and not too many heady words. Um, depending on your listeners or your learners, right? Because some of us teach learners who want to know everything about it, but some of us teach learners who like, they can't capture all of that in that high level English and that very, you know, like a phonological blah, blah, blah stuff. And so we do it and we have them practice it and they almost just like, yeah, they feel, they feel it. So this is very nice to be able to feel it and introduce all of the things about vowel sounds and positions in the mouth and their relationship, the rhythm, the stressed vowel, and all of those sorts of things. And fun in everything from words to, to sentences to possibly stories. Yeah. So how about the rest of you who are doing um, classroom oh. teaching? Um, say something. Yeah. Abigail, if you had a question. I did, it's just a comment. Actually, I attended a, a session with you, Karen, a, uh, maybe a month or so ago, and I used this in my class just with word stress. And one of my Taiwanese students who really struggles with pronunciation just like grabbed onto that technique. And now she'll just be sitting at her desk, like like using her arm and like it just helps her. So I just that's just one. Oh, I'm glad so that. it was really worked well. Thanks. Sometimes it does the trick. Um, sometimes it doesn't, you know, and then you find the rubber band is the thing that does the trick, but something kinesthetic, something that is spatial because of that time on the vowel. That's so different from so many other languages that do have stress. We've got that times based stress, not the pitch based so much. Right. Um, I mean, some people want to be more um, monotone, you know, we have monotone speakers of English, but they use time on vowel and that's what makes them so comprehensible. So thanks for that. Um, there were some other questions. You know, some folks were asking questions. If you didn't get to read the chat, you should stream through it because there were some great answers there. But one thing I'll mention for just a few of those folks that knew the chart from uh, some of the, the past days, past years, we did do uh, make some changes to the fifth edition chart. Um, you might remember that we had a red dress and rose coat. Those two change mostly because when you boil down the image of a dress and a coat and red and, and pink, they both, they become very similar. They look like dresses and they look like women's clothing and people are like, what are those things? You know, and we have a shirt and there's just a lot of clothing going on suddenly. So we boiled them down to a red pepper because it's so different from everything else. And the boat is really different from everything else. So when you get to little icons on your phone, you know, everybody can see those and they're a little more gender neutral as a, as a set of images. Thank you so much, Karen, for uh, making this really a hands-on workshop. Um, I thought that was wonderful. Um, my first question is um, whether you use this chart. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you do, but how differently do you use the chart and this method depending on the student's overall level of English proficiency? So like, would you be able to, to give me any tips on like um, getting my level one or two students started with that? And yeah. also how, how could I use it most effectively with advanced level students? Wonderful. I'll say um, the chart started with very advanced students at the University of Maryland um, so it's always kind of, you know, just check your assumptions with, if you were thinking this is for young students or for beginners. This actually started with engineering students mostly and economists, uh, people who had a lot of long words and people who were very analytical. Uh, these were students who would, you know, very comfortable transcribing a word into IPA. And yet they sounded the same that they did before they transcribed the word into IPA. So um, I I found myself, um, I, I banished IPA from the classroom for a while. And we said, you know, we're just going to replace phonetic symbols in this way. And we're just gonna aim, and at the time I was doing a lot with rubber bands, um, but we got to think of the, sort of the focal point of our speech for those very advanced learners. It took them, um, 
it, it didn't take them long to switch over and it freed them up cognitively to not think so much in such great detail. So that's the advantage for the advanced learners. Um, you just talk very little, as little as possible about it and you do it, right? So we've got molecule, molecule, olive sock, molecule. What happens to molecule when it becomes an adjective? <laughs> molecular, molecular. I had my student who said, I study molecular biology and molecular biology, molecular, molecular, molecular biology, molecular bi, y, 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 that little Y up there, biology, molecular biology. And then we had that all worked out beautifully, right? Um, so that's a little glimpse of the advanced level. Uh, for beginners, I can tell you uh, that I was at University of Maryland when 9-11 happened. And we, in about a year and a half, we all lost our jobs um, because of the visas, right? And I moved into adult ed and literacy adult ed uh, down in Virginia. And I took the chart with me and found that it was wonderful with low literacy adults, again, because of the lack of symbols, um, keeping things simple. And with that, I found that the use of the image cards, now you can even sort of break it out. This is the whole mouth. And, you know, you don't always want to have to look at all of it. You can break it down into one sound and you can introduce the chart, say, with three really different sounds with green tea, black cat and blue moon. Really, you know, different parts of the space there. So you can just pull out the, the black card and just work on green and then um and my blue was stolen by teenagers. No, it's right there. <laughs> There's ooh. Um, I'll then use this as my last transition because I'm watching our time. But when I first had my kids, this is now 14 years ago, let's say 11 years ago when they were three. Now I'm talking about young learners. I simply took two cards and I put them on the floor. They were actually pieces of foam, but they were two colors, blue and green. And you can start phonemic and phon phonological awareness with three-year-olds. It's beautiful. So I put them on the floor. And I said, I'm going to say a word and you jump on it if it's green. And if it's if it's blue, you jump on the blue. So I'd say, you know, um, peaches. And it didn't take very long at all to train my little kids <laughs> to jump on the color that matched the word, uh, the vowel sound and the, the stress syllable. OK, so then you can add a third and add a fourth. So just think of that, like just think of that image of of either a kind of fly swatter activity, jumping, uh, touching in one way or another and you expand with those adults or with kids into the whole chart. Um, there, you don't have to teach every vowel sound because it generalizes at some point, like, oh my gosh, I get it, you know, purple shirt, or uh, as soon as they start to realize that the, they're hearing the same sound in both words, they can say, oh, the silver sound, oh, the blue sound. And then you'll see that wonderful play where they start to guess and, and guess incorrectly, but closely. And, and that starts telling you you're in the zone, okay? I hope that answers your question in, you know, short form. All right, thank you so much, Marsha. I really appreciate having uh, you having me here. All right, thank you so much, Karen, for your excellent workshop. And also thank you very much for all of our tops, our teachers of pronunciation for attending today and being such active participants. That's what really makes our, um, our top events very top, top, top. So we would uh, really um, like to give you a, a hand. And if those of you would like to open your mics so she can hear our applause. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Next sessions.